afternoon. Let's get going. We've got this amazing speaker. So this series is called How to Reach the Top or How I Reach the Top. And it's really a dose of inspiration that we need in all our lives. It's not just for lawyers. Uh, it's for everyone. This is recorded so you can like overwatch it on um, the uh, podcast and YouTube channel, which lots of people do. And um, Ruth Harrison, who's managing partner of ThoughtWorks. It's just an amazing woman. I've been trying to get her literally for so long. I'm delighted that she's able to spend an hour with us uh, this uh, afternoon. I was going to say evening then. It's just because it's so wet and dark. Um, so welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, Ruth, you're from the Northeast. Um, how did you become the managing partner of ThoughtWorks? Gosh, I've got to go back quite a number of years. Um, I've been in industry now for four decades, and you're right, I'm, I'm from the northeast. You can probably tell from my accent. Um, I still live in the north. I think it probably helps people to kind of understand how how I've moved into the sectors. Uh, and I had a very standard kind of normal education. I'm from a working class background, and had great parents, and uh, he was very very supportive. And it might be interesting to hear. Actually, I did have aspirations at one point to be a lawyer. Wow. And uh, I, um, I, I left home. I did. I, I actually did think at one point I might like to be a lawyer. Uh, I looked into it and realised I needed extensive qualities from pursuing something um, that I thought I made quite good at. And I kind of grown out of um, mainstream education. I think I, I felt that I wanted to do something else, I wanted to pursue something else. Both of my parents had been in, in retail. My mum had taken time out to look after my brother and I. Uh, our children had returned um, after career break. So I had, they worked hard, dressed, and you went to work, and, and, and that was a very strong work ethic that I think um, certainly um, rubbed off on me. I moved up to, uh, I, so I got a job in retail as a consequence of that. It was what I knew and, and I, I understood it. I'd almost been schooled in that. And um, at 17, I uh, got promoted at work, um, and that required me to move to Scotland. I was 17, so I left home. Um, my parents were clearly anxious because I was quite, quite young, younger than if I'd been going to university for sure. And I started my retail career. <clears throat> In Scotland, um, I met my husband when I was 19. Um, we returned to the North East from the school in my early 20s. And I continued my retail career for uh, to move with my husband's work down to London. I think your initial question when we well, I, I went to London with, with my husband's work and I, I took a, a role with a um, uh, cosmetics company actually, uh, Elizabeth Arden at the time. So I was moving from to an office environment into wholesale and retail and starting to understand the administrative side of, of business facing um, shop floor side as I had. I was very fortunate that I got exposure to um, new experiences. We were uh, sold by uh, Unilever and divested, so I had to work on the um, divestment programs. So that was new experience for me as well. And at that point in time, I was uh, during my time with Elizabeth Arden. I was given um, quite a lot of the graduate trainees to um, on board and teach and coach. And graduate trainees were going off and getting really great jobs in Unilever and other big organisations and, and things that sounded hugely grand. And, and I thought, I'm sitting over here and I'm working hard and I'm training people when I'm not able to get into the same positions as they are. And I, I just I kind of wondered um, if I'd done the right thing by leaving school quite so early as I did. And um, whilst I was enjoying my career, I did start to feel as if I may be limiting myself. Um, so from there, um, we had another opportunity to move to my husband's job and we moved to the Middle East uh, and started to live in Kuwait. But just at that point in time, I had decided that I wanted to do an MBA. <clears throat> Pardon me. And I started, I've been enrolled with Stirling University to study uh, business management there, self-funding, and we had a chance to move to, as I said, to the Middle East. So I was 
in a new country, in a new territory, starting to uh, do a, a, a senior, you know, high level education, having left school at 15 with no, no first degree, I was fortunate to be taken on because of my, my tenured experience in industry to, um, to, 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 to do my, as I say, to do my MBA. And I, I returned each term to sit my exams in Scotland, um, do the, the, that weekend's cohort of, of study and then return back to Kuwait to do my um, subsequent essays and, 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 and distance learning. That took two years and then I did my uh, dissertation. Uh, during that time, I'd uh, made good alliances with colleagues in travel retail, and I did a um, my dissertation on the in-flight consumer behaviour uh, patterns, and I think it was my recommendation. You, some of you may have seen magazines when you get onto a plane that have, from the front, it appeals to women readers, and from when you reverse it over, it appeals to men readers, and, and kind of the pages meet in the middle because men weren't looking at the magazines, only women were, and uh, men had a higher propensity to spend on pocket electronics, which was a higher ticket price than perhaps just buying mascara and lipstick. So my, some, my recommendations were taken in full, and um, I was delighted that uh, something I had suggested was, was taken forward in the industry, and it's fairly common standard now for, for most airlines. Um, that brought me, uh, my husband returned, and I returned back, to the United Kingdom and as a consequence of that I was starting to feel a little bit like this the stuff going on in industry with technology and retail's not catching up and, 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 and staying ahead of the market and I knew I wanted to move into technology but there was a few things uh, holding me back one I, I wasn't a technologist and I can't code and I still can't but I would love to learn I didn't have any contacts in the technology industry and I was a female in an industry that was predominantly male. And I was at the wrong end of the age spectrum. I wasn't a young, you know, startup enthusiast. I was, you know, at that point, in my, certainly in my 40s and in my 50s now. And uh, I was like, okay, I haven't got much going for me here. This is going to be an up, uphill struggle. Um, and I was very fortunate that I'd maintained good relationships with some headhunters of, of my time in industry um, within the retail sector spoke to them about my aspirations and one came back and said, I think I've got a perfect role. I have a technology company who wants to set up a retail division. They don't have retail experience, but they've got technology experience. I thought, well, that's great because I don't have technology experience, but I have retail experience. Let's talk. Uh, that was six years ago. Uh, I started, I uh, was one of the founding starters of the retail division within ThoughtWorks. Um, which we grew to about 25% of the overall business. And then two years, uh, sorry, four years ago, I was asked to uh, take on the managing director role in the UK. So that's a very potted, potted journey of 35 years as to leaving school, having aspirations, taking opportunities, um, sometimes realizing that what you're doing is not fulfilling you, identifying what you want to do and then trying to make it happen. Hope that helps. Um, wow. Yes, it does help hugely. Um, I, I mean, look, you are hugely, re hugely successful. I'm not going to go through all your list of achievements uh, because people can just Google you, right? Um, or just go on LinkedIn. But that was a detailed history because sometimes, particularly for women, they see somebody and they think, oh, well, they're doing well. They look great. You know, you're great with your staff. And they think, oh, well, you've just had it all on a plate, which hasn't being the case for you or many of the guests that I have on here and so I just wanted that to come across before I ask you you know some other questions really uh, sure. because having reached the top as you have you've not just stopped there have you you've been passionate about women and girls in technology um, and indeed uh, in industry and business really you know encouraging um, and promoting so you're on you know the Northern Power Women um, one of the most powerful women in the north of England list, uh, tick. There's like a whole list I've got here. I'm, I'm just going to run through it. Um, but the reason I'm asking this is that you've actually carried on encouraging women and women who code uh, careers um, in more than the obvious ways. You know, we met speaking at a school trying to encourage girls yes. uh, about professions. Um, but beyond that, you know, you set up Limitless, which is about... Um, promoting women from different sectors because you believe we can all learn from each other. I wonder if you could just share a bit about 
why is it important for you to pay it forward? Do you know what I mean? Because you could just sit there and think, well, actually, I, I left school at 60. I've made it now. It's not everyone else. Uh, I'm there. Um, and and there's, there's days I do kind of think, oh, my goodness, you know, I want to put my feet up. But but I suppose um, I, I'm, I'm very motivated. I think driven and motivation are two very different things. I think when I was younger, I was very driven. Um, now I'm motivated by different things. I think uh, perhaps it's a level of age maturity, I'm not sure, where you look for different things to fulfill you and you realise that time is running out. And I'm talking professionally, time is running out to start to make imp have impact and make a difference and start to speed things up. You know, you've been very um, uh, flattering about some of the things I've achieved, but that's taken 35 years. Uh, and if I kind of look at maybe other, other colleagues in, in, in industry, they wouldn't have taken 35 years and, and maybe they've had different opportunities maybe they've seized opportunities and done things differently maybe they went to different schools had different connections etc and i i just i have a compelling um belief that if it doesn't, which is why I, I created limitless so limitless is a forum for um, women in business and leadership who uh, perhaps a vice president or, or above because I have, a, I have a very strong belief that there's not enough uh, female representation in the boardroom. And I believe that the boardroom is the, is the place now that to affect change across industry. And because perhaps of, of the exposure and experience I've had, I do sometimes have the ear of, of people in senior positions. Not always, but, but, but I, I have more now clearly than I did when I was younger in the early stages of my career. So I, well, what I identified was that when women get into position of leadership and get onto boards, there's very few of them. And there's no allyship and there's no there's nobody for them to lean on. They, perhaps they don't have the go down to the pub and have a pint structure or maybe they're not into the golfing um, group. And that's not always the case. I don't want to suggest that, that all boards are, are, are completely macho. They're not, not. And there are some great pro progressive boards, but there are still too few women. And, and you just have to Google to find the, the poor representation in the FTSE and such. So Limitless was created as a forum for senior women leaders to be able to connect with other women leaders, to share experiences, to have off the record conversations and not feel uh, uncomfortable or exposed, to be able to say, look, I've not done this before. Has anybody else and can, can, you know, can, can somebody support me and just have a coffee with me or a glass of wine or a chat or whatever it happens to be? And to start to create those networks for ourselves. We started it um, within a week because the marketing team and ThoughtWorks support me greatly and I, I couldn't do it on my own and have a full-time job. Um, so we, <clears throat> we convened three times a year. When we were able to meet in person, we used to host a lunch uh, under Chatham House rules just so it was comfortable for the audience. Um, and then I would always interview the host so we could take some content and, and share it more broadly, perhaps for people who, who couldn't join for, for the lunch. Um, and then more recently, we've, we've had to take that initiative online. So we've been going now for a year and a half. Um, I've interviewed some amazing and awesome people uh, who, who you know, inspire me. Um, everyone I've asked to participate has said yes. And I think that's just an amazing testament to the fact that women actually do want to help women um, and, and other, certainly underrepresented gender minorities, for sure. Uh, and I... I, I, I get excited by thinking it could just get bigger and more impactful. And we've got 240 members, I think, so far. And that's just, just on a LinkedIn group, no cost, just invitation only, um, you know, in, introducing and referral and, and ensuring that we maintain uh, the quality of membership as well so it doesn't become diluted. Um, so it's been exciting. Yeah, really, really, really exciting. I'm just going to, you just have to listen to this now. Sure. Uh, uh, the line isn't great, and I don't know whether it's my internet connection uh, here. But um, I, I wanted to just say that Ruth is a business leader uh, and is a commentator evolving in business technology and indeed the landscape. She's an experienced board level executive with past roles, including CEO and chief operating officer and CMO and VP. Um, uh, she's considered a specialist company turnaround, brand building, accelerated growth strategies and business transformation, including strategic trading, role models, operation, excellence, resilience, working within a world leading commercial organizations and academic institutions. She, fo she focuses on stakeholder value, creating as a managing director for ThoughtWorks UK, board advisor and it goes on you know this is all about you this is my favorite bit in um 2008 ruth was appointed by the bima b 
BIMA in the top 100 UK digital leaders and in 2017 also nominated Diversity Leader of the Year by Tech Leaders UK. She was recognised in Northern Power Women's Top 50 list, I already said that, in 2018. The media commentator from various newspapers, including BBC, uh, BBC Sunday Politics, Business Debate, uh, Sydney Morning Herald, the uh, New York Times, Daily Telegraph. It goes on. I'm getting exhausted just reading it, right? Ruth is passionate about UK Tech uh, North Advocate, a board member of Dynamo um, Northeast, a nonprofit organization, uh, Northeast organization, Future Charity, um, and also holds a, 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 a executive MBA from Stirling University. The reason I was reading that out was that you sometimes have to stop yourself to go, oh gosh, that's me. And how do you remain authentic, you know, in a world when we've got a lot of sort of fake leaders? You see what I mean? Who don't talk yeah. about perhaps the struggles. Like when you were saying you were doing the MBA, when you were going to another country where you're not going to have family and love and support and you were going to the Middle East, I was thinking, Jesus Christ, you know, that was enough to put me off. Do, you know, how do you remain authentic when you've achieved so much and others regard you in such high regard? Well, thank you for... I mean, I'm hugely flattered and sometimes when I hear all that, I, I perhaps don't recognise myself. I don't know whether that's a, a positive thing for women or a failing that we, we probably a little bit more humble. Um, <clears throat> my, my grandmother was a, a, a Scottish Presbyterian uh, churchgoer and, and cook, someone who was just fantastic at cooking, baking, etc. And she was extremely uh, grounded and very level headed. In fact, if anyone's seen Downton Abbey, my grandmother was was one of the, the ladies who used to wear the black outfit. She was in service, um, and I think that um, that she was a huge influence on on me as a, as a young girl, and and continued to be, and, and obviously until she passed. Um, and I think just the people who we have in our formative years help shape our, our thinking. I mean, very grateful to, to, for the things I've been successful at, um, things I've, I think we have to also be mindful that it's taken 35 years to achieve some of those things and clearly when you're putting something on LinkedIn you don't list all the things you've not been successful at and things you've failed at and I would be very honest and humble and say that list is just as long. Um, you know that there's there's a reality there and I think it's a fallacy if we think that success is easy. I think we have to be cognizant that as we're shaping our career and, and publicizing ourselves out in the marketplace, we, we have to list the things that we have been successful at and, 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 and our, our achievements and should be proud of those. Um, your question about how, how to kind of have humility is that as a leader, you're in service and you're in service to other people. And I think the minute you, you lose sight of that, then um, you may not be a successful leader or if you are a successful leader, it may be for the short term. And I think for, for, for leaders who want to have impact for the long term, um, then that, that's important. I can think in my career, when I've moved roles and moved jobs, there's people who've moved with me um, because they wanted to continue being part of a successful team or the dynamics that, of, of a working style. And I'm very flattered and, and grateful to have had that opportunity. So I think humility comes from recognizing that you're still in service. Uh, and as a servant leader, it is about empowering and helping other people. It's certainly easier to do, the, the, perhaps the more senior you become in an organisation because you, you should impact and affect culture. So I think humility comes from individuals. I think a lot of it has to do with upbringing. Um, I think sometimes it can also be hold people back, particularly females. I think we can be over humble. I think we're all, all very cognizant that when we see a job advert, we'll find 10 reasons why we don't have all the skills and qualifications and shouldn't apply, as opposed to looking and saying, well, I can do 80% of that role and I'll learn the rest. Um, we, we tend not to view it like that, and, and that's been proven as a um, more more gender bias towards women and underrepresented gender minorities. It tends to be how we process and analyse things. Yeah, um, that is spot on. C can I ask you about kind of like who inspires you? And 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 uh, it's a double question now because you can be thinking about the first question. Um, and and I wonder if you can give us kind of some. <coughs> tips for success or tips for getting over failures because you're right 
we don't list our failures. We don't list, you know, the rejection letters, we, you know, on LinkedIn. I mean, I talk about them publicly um, in school just so young people can see and, and hear wherever. But we don't actually as leaders. That We're not being brought up like that. So I just wonder kind of, you know, who inspires you as opposed to carry on or to have carried on? Um, and if you've got some, you know, some three tips um, and advice to your younger self, like, you know, when you look back to think, you know, now to me, leaving school without any qualifications, I'm thinking, oh, I shouldn't blaspheme. Christ, if any of my kids were doing that. <gasps> but if they turn out like you, that's OK. But do you know what I mean? You know, look, looking back, any advice to your younger self and indeed who inspires you or inspired you? Yeah, um, I've spoken to my grandmother clearly, who was someone who was a huge influence on me. Um, I, I spent a lot of time with her when I, when I was a young, young child. My, my, my mother was, was, was poorly when I was little, so my, my grandmother stepped into doing a lot of the, that, that kind of role and responsibility unconsciously. You know, when you're a kid, it's just your grandma, you just you know, adore them. Um, so she had a, a very uh, pivotal impact on me certainly and someone who I miss and adore and, and actually in my sitting room I have a sepia picture of my grandmother on her first day of service as 15 years of age in her maid's outfit with a string of pearls and she's had all her hair cut off because she was meant to have short hair at the time uh, and I still have that and I look at it uh, and, I, and I it it reminds me of I suppose my roots and uh, that's important um I think more modern day and I I remember seeing the, the film a couple of years ago on a flight of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and I was just completely blown away and I, I, I didn't know of her, I wasn't in her sector, her industry it was, I think it was about two, two, two and a half, three years ago when the original movie came out. Um, and I watched it twice because I was just so enthralled that someone had um, such conviction and such passion and, and, and humility that not only did she do her own study, she studied on behalf of her husband and, and conveyed and, and, and took his notes and, and they both you know, went on to, to have hugely successful careers. But I think just that, um, personal conviction, and then how she went about uh, seeking justice for the underrepresented and taking on on responsibilities and taking on uh, um, uh, legal fights that nobody else would take on. And importantly, not just would they not take it on, at the time, uh, society didn't think it was the right thing to do, didn't think that um, carers should have representation, didn't think that women should be better represented, etc. didn't feel that, you know, even if we think back recent, until I think it was the 1970s, women still had to ask their husband permission to have a bank account. You know, these are things that I can't comprehend because it was before my time. I was born born in the 70s, so I didn't experience it. But had it not been for trailblazers like her, we wouldn't have some of the privilege that we, we experience today. And, um, I, I clearly uh, followed her since and have just been totally mesmerised and, and, and in awe of her, her, her right success, but her success coming from doing the right thing. And I think that's important. It wasn't just commercial success. Clearly, she's become a very wealthy woman, but, but her overall success and what she's actually done, and I guess you'd call that more of a legacy than a commercial success. Undoubtedly, she's had both. And then, of course, when I, I learned recently that she was poorly and had, had cancer return, you just have that real foreboding thinking, gosh, you know, we recognize people can't live forever, but there are some people who should, you know, they should be immortalized because they could just go, continue to go on and do more good things. And then obviously she's passed recently. I think we're all, all very aware of that is that we all need to kind of take a little bit of her courage and, you know, one person shouldn't have the responsibility of trying to change um, institutions, shouldn't have the responsibility of seeking to try and change you know, legal systems and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the justice system, um, for fairness and equality, we've all got a responsibility to that. So I, I, I suppose on reflection, her legacy is something that I'm hoping will continue to impact me and, and, and other women of, of all ages uh, and backgrounds. Um, so that's kind of role models and there'll be others, you know, people I work with daily who we just, who I think we have to, to also look at it <laughs> Impact doesn't need to be at, at, at such a high level uh, and, and so visible. Impact can be very small. It can be just the kind and, and, and decent things that people do. Um, my husband challenges me quite regularly to, to and keeps me in check, keeps me grounded um, for sure. And uh, you know, he's he's a. Um, we sometimes expect women to say other women are their role models, and, and occasionally we we have to have men role models who are really good feminists, uh, and I'm very very proud of that. What advice would I give to my younger self? Um, I think uh, get, get a find a mentor, find someone who um, 
you can relate to, you can be honest with, and who will be honest with you and tell you, you you're being a bit bonkers now, just get, you know, get, get grounded, or someone who can challenge you and say, where's your confidence gone? Go for that. And, and knows you well enough to be able to push you when you need pushing and harness you when you need harnessing. That's a sign of a good mentor. Um, not every mentor should push you forward in, in, into danger zones. Uh, it, it, it needs to be a good relationship. Um, I think you need to own your awesomeness. We spoke of that maybe at the beginning of, of this call and, and we sometimes forget that um, nobody else is going to champion your cause. Uh, it's not in their best interest to do that. Um, our friends and family probably will, but I think more broadly you have to own your own awesomeness and, and take that forward with courage. And then I I think the other, the last thing I would say, uh, looking back now in my 50s to what I would have done differently in my teens and, and early 20s is not to have fear. Um, I, I think maybe very early in my, my teenage career, I probably didn't have fear, but I think that's just naivety. There's a big difference. Um, and as you start having life experiences, you become a little bit more cautious, um, a little bit more, perhaps a bit more risk averse. And I think some professions, that's good. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to be a, a surgeon who took risks. Um, but I'm talking more broadly, more generally. I think um, to be a little more fearless. Uh, in my younger years, I think would have would have been something that would have perhaps helped me. Um, but everyone's different. Some people are a bit more gung ho and and seem to to to, to get on with it. Uh, and perhaps was a little bit more reserved. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, I, I've been writing these things down. I didn't think I was going to be learning this afternoon. Jeez, I'm inspired. Now, listen, I'm going to ask you a really personal question. Well, I'm going to ask in a minute about well being and what you try and do. To for mm -hmm. self care, time out, yeah. just looking after yourself. But before that, um, uh, you've had a haircut since I last saw you, and probably came. You know, you look great. Don't let me reopen. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. It's like, oh gosh, tell us about it. I you know. I'm seriously. I've got rid of my French plaits now. Uh, but um, oh, uh, it's a really just interesting question. Really, before lockdown, you stopped dyeing your hair. So normally you're blonde. Mm -hmm. And then, but you still look great, great. Um, and you've kept the great. So my question is really, um, why did you do that? And that, because it's about authenticity, like, you know, owning who you are and being comfortable with it. And you have to be at the stage where you're happy to, you know, go out with no makeup or whatever the minor issues are. So I just yeah. wonder, did you think about it? Or did you just think, oh, I can't be bothered? Um, uh, and because you look so so great, you know, with the haircut, I just wonder how that came about and how that fits in with you know your you being authentic in the way that you are. It it was a very conscious decision, and actually, I think before you and I met, I was actually brunette. I've been brunette all my life, and and very long dark hair. I think Kate might remember me being brunette, and if you kind of look at old pictures of me, you'll see certainly mid length um, long dark hair. Um, my family have red hair. My, my maternal and paternal grandparents are redhead, so you know, redhead has red hair has a tendency to go white quite early. So I can recall them in my twenties starting to get white, you know, very coarse white hair. And I think every woman, you know, claims that I I had quite a lot. Um, certainly for a woman, so I've, I've dyed my hair, you know, highlights, lowlights, everything. But it's always been shades of caramel brown, etc. For for donkey's years. Um, and then I think just about three and a half years ago, uh, I was going to the hairdressers and I was having to go every two and a half weeks to have my roots done because it was just, just so much white hair was coming through. Uh, and, you know, I suppose vanity is you don't want all your white hair coming through because it just looks awful having you know, an interest of white hair. It kind of looks trendy on a young girl to have dark roots and blonde hair, but the other way around is, is less attractive. Um, so I was going very regularly and I was starting to think, I'm putting a lot of chemicals all over my head. I'm not just kind of doing strands and things. And I'm like, I, that can't be good for you. It really can't. And I worked in the cosmetics industry and I thought there's certain things you just wouldn't put on your, your face or your hair, you know, your, your skin for that length of time. Um, so it was a conscious decision. And I spoke to this, this the hairdresser and she said, like, well, you know, we can make you lighter and lighter and it'll take a long time. And I'm, I have no patience. It's a bad characteristic of mine. I'm not patient. And I thought, I'm, I don't really want to be kind of going through the, you know, 50 shades of lighter stage uh, and taking 10 years to get there. Um, cut it all off, make me blonde, uh, and then I'll let the grey go through, grow through the blonde, uh, and then I'll grow it, which I've grown it down to a bob now. So if you saw photographs of me, that was two years ago, I had quite short hair, uh, which is a huge contrast. But my, the question is, it was very intentional. Um, I was changing it because I felt it was, I didn't want to put chemicals on. 
and I actually thought my skin tone and everything's changing now. Maybe I just look a little bit. I'm very pale skin. Pale skin and dark hair can look a little bit um, uh, harsh. And I think, well, that's not. It wasn't the look I was going for. And as I was aging, I thought, well, let's just it's embrace my age. And I wanted. I had a psychological view, and I thought, okay, I'm going to be uh, 50 in silver. Um, I, you know, I thought we 50 silver and and slim and sexy and all these things. I, I, I didn't manage to achieve all of it, but as I say, I, I'm being honest with you, telling you, but I managed to get to 50 and I managed to get to silver. I'm still working on some of the other other uh, other goals. Um, but that answered your question. So my intention is to grow a little bit longer, maybe about another two inches, uh, and just keep it white, and uh, and just put a little bit of low lights. And I'm like everyone who's got light hair now. I use that purple shampoo periodically just to kind of give it a lift. So oh, yeah, a different it. era. Um, uh, and, a, and a different look, and it was very intentional. Well, I hope we all look as good as you. That's what I'm thinking. You know, I need to be totally. Yeah, look, everyone's nodding. Um, and Ruth, can, you know, you've got a big job. You sit on lots of boards, um, and you're inspiring a lot of women and men, actually, those in business. What What do you do for kind of self care and your well being? Um, or, or what would you like to do? You know, I appreciate that uh, we're not all good at it. Uh, but I just wonder, how do you look after your wellness and your well-being? Well, I always get a, a full admiration when I, I see women of my age um, who've managed to get the work-life work life balance and, and, and their well-being. I will be really honest with with, with you and, and anyone who's dialed in saying, I'm really bad at it, really, really bad. In fact, my husband nags me a lot about, uh, I, you know, I'm not proud of this at, at, at all. You know, um, I eat breakfast late and I shouldn't. Um, I my diary will get very full and my lunch will end up being 3 30 4 o'clock uh, you know I can find myself perhaps being locked in the office I'm clearly like, like, really I'm working from home right now so I'm fortunate I have a, a room that, that, that doubles as an office um, <clears throat> pardon me and I don't even get out for, for any fresh air and yet I live in Northumberland you know I've, I've got some of the most beautiful nature walks at my disposal so I have no excuse I think that's the reality that um, my my bad habits, my bad bad well being is my fault. Uh, I can't blame anybody else. So um, interesting enough, he, he and my husband and I had a, had an extensive conversation about that yesterday morning, and uh, kind of committed that uh, I need to start putting some time in my diary for that leg stretch, even if it's just a fresh air mindset reset. Um, I'm an introvert, so t you know, t reflective time and just listening to quiet music, etc., is something I really enjoy. Mm. and uh, more than perhaps than other people who like going out and being energized I, I quite like the internalizing and, and, and just taking some peaceful time so um, as I say I, I have no excuse um, and I, but I'm not good at it I need to get better school report would say can do better <laughs> um, well but uh, I, I, I could talk to you as you know all day but uh, I'd like us just all to clap for Ruth first before we come to questions from the floor Gosh. Thank you. Amazing.